Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into American political origins and evolving institutions. The executive director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this continuing conversation. Here he is now, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Go, Bill. Thank you, Bob Kincaid. Thank you, Bob Kincaid. Welcome to a Tuesday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Today is Tuesday. It is the last day, the 31st day of October in the year 2017. It is Halloween, as I'm sure everybody listening knows. Uh, and it is yet a, another beautiful day here in Appalachia. And I hope it's a very beautiful day where you are as, as well. Thank you for your continued support of this program and of uh, Bob Kincaid, Agnes, and the folks at Head On Radio. Uh, we really appreciate your continued support and, and, and loyalty and your, your willingness to, uh, to hang in there with us. And I saw on, online the other day that Bob began his 13th year of broadcasting on this network. That's just amazing to me, absolutely amazing. And I actually uh, forgot it yesterday, forgot to mention it yesterday, but I did want to congratulate Bob, and let me do it now because... Um, it, that's, that's an incredible feat. Um, given the fact that there's not the kind of money that usually we associate with the media, there's no money pouring in. And, and this is more than anything I've ever seen, a labor of love. And I think it's just an incredible contribution that Bob and Agnes and those folks make uh, to keeping the public informed is, I guess, what I could say. Thanks, Let Bill. Me, uh, oh, you're welcome, Bob. And let me start off by explaining... Uh, and apologizing for the fact that we started the program a couple of minutes late today because Bob and I were in a heated conversation and we kind of lost, lost track of the time. And what we were talking about was the article in the New York Times uh, referenced yesterday called The Lost Children of Chum, uh, which is about the uh, Irish children born out of wedlock uh, that this absolutely miraculous woman um, uh, sp uh, named Catherine uh, took took her time and basically made the determination and the decision to dig up information on these children and find out something uh, that had been buried for so long and that people didn't want to talk about and everybody was looking the other way and and uh, just just an incredible and powerful story well written um, and Bob had commented that he read it yesterday and we started to talk about exactly uh, how powerful it is so. Um, with that as a, you know, as a recommendation, the fact that it, it genuinely moved Bob Kincaid and it moved me when I first read it. And I do encourage you. I was noticing that it's still on the New York Times website. So uh, if you haven't read it, I would really I really would encourage you to uh, to take to take a look at it and read it. It's uh, it's something that I think everybody should read it. You don't have to be Irish to appreciate this one. And you don't have to be Catholic either. In fact, I think the, the article raises serious questions about being being Roman Catholic at all uh, after after this. I mean, this is this is frightening, but it's an absolutely, absolutely beautiful story about a very, very powerful, strong, strong woman who basically lived according to her principles. And ultimately, what comes through here is that the church may have taught values and principles and ideals, but unfortunately, too often the church doesn't live up to them, but some of its people do, and this lady is one. And as Bob made the comment uh, in our conversation, that this woman is carrying the burden of the church and the responsibilities of the church and her government and Ireland and everything else, uh, it, is, it is a powerful, powerful piece of, piece of reading. Um, let me uh, uh, go through the, the, the basics before we get into today's program. Um, first of all, getting on the air. We would love to have you on the air. I keep saying that, um, but I do mean it. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and if you are inclined to comment on some of the issues of the day, and of course with the first indictments coming out of the special counsel Robert Mueller's office and, and the reactions to those indictments and what this might mean, and is this the beginning of something bigger and bigger? And is it getting is 
uh, is the the noose getting closer, uh, tighter? And and uh, I was just reading on the Washington Post uh, an account of yesterday at the White House and the reactions to the Mueller indictments. And one of the people in the White House had made the comment and said, the walls are closing in on us. And uh, the story of the president uh, staying upstairs yesterday morning and watching television news accounts of the of the indictments and the reactions and and all the rest of it. It's really, really pretty powerful stuff. Um, so if you'd like to comment on those or on some of the things we've talked about here on the Virtual Center, by all means, we, we would love to hear from you. Uh, just just go to Bob Kincaid uh, uh, Horn on Skype, and that'll get you into the studio, and Bob will get you on the air. Um, if you'd like to share your thoughts with me in an email, I'd be glad to get them on the air in your name. Uh, just send your email to me, waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. And I draw your attention or, or, uh, to our Facebook page. Um, if you are a regular user of Facebook, uh, and, and millions and millions of folks are, uh, then you know how easy it is. Just go to facebook.com, and that's the home page. And in the search box at the top, just type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, and you will be on to our Facebook page. And there are a number of postings there. I put two or three on there over the weekend, uh, and I'm sure that I'll be putting a few more on there as as well. Um, and and uh, if, you know, in the in the next several days, I know that I'll be putting a few on there. I've got a couple of uh, things in mind that I think I want to uh, um, address on Facebook. In fact, uh, program today is going to address is going to deal with one, with uh, with one of these issues, and it's of course it deals with the issue of of higher education, which we really started to get to get into yesterday. Uh, I've already mentioned the uh, Mueller indictments. And what they might mean, it's obviously the topic of conversation in all the media outlets, all the uh, talk shows on, on terrestrial radio and the, and the cable news programs uh, as well. I think everybody's talking about it and what they might mean. And, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, the one thing that I've noticed in, in, this, in this whole scenario leading up to this indictments is the is the shield that seems to have emerged around Robert Mueller. I, I think that one thing I've, I've begun to notice is that nobody re really, well, let me, I, let me take that back. That's not true. I was going to say nobody attacks the credibility of Bob Mueller. But indeed, there is a concerted effort to try to jeopardize the integrity of Mueller in order to um, – uh, have a have an impact on what might be coming out of the Mueller investigations, but the fact of the matter is, prominent Republicans and Democrats at like attest uh, alike attest to the professionalism and the quality of objectivity of Robert Mueller for the most part, and I think that's very important. Um, in response, the White House, in response to suggestions or implications that there might be a move afoot to replace Bob Mueller in order to stop some of these indictments, um, that particular uh, possibility uh, is getting negative all over the place. Uh, nobody even wants to go there and talk about it. And so I think basically we've reached the point where there's no turning back. And I think the decision has been made by those who are most frightened by what the Mueller investigations might turn up uh, that there's really not much of an alternative at this point except to basically uh, suck it up, if you will, and, 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 and kind of trying to ride out the storm. And that seems to be what's, what's uh, happening, at least for the, for the moment. Um, we spent a little bit of time yesterday on the president's tax cuts. And, of course, the fact of the matter is there's a lot happening this week. But all of it, it's, is, it seems to me, is being pushed onto, into the, onto the back burner, if you will, by the Mueller indictments. Um, Friday, the president leaves for a 12-day trip to Asia. 
uh, and he will visit uh, not only Japan and South Korea, but Beijing as well. Uh, and there was a teleconference yesterday from Beijing uh, with, Xing, with Xi Jinping, the president of, of China, uh, and uh, communicating with some of the major uh, companies, uh, communications companies. Uh, Zuckerberg was in on the conference uh, as well as as uh, as others, and uh, this seems to be a prelude to the president's trip, uh, which begins on Friday. Also later this week, the ingredients of the president's tax cut proposal, the Republicans' tax cuts proposal, um, is uh, to be made public, and most of the speculation so far, and we did a lot of the. Uh, got into a lot of that analysis of what we know so far on the tax bill uh, at the beginning, at the front end of yesterday's program. And while we're just dealing at this point uh, with with hints and outlines and all and all the rest of it, the details are are yet to come. It's clear that there's serious opposition to this tax cut program beginning to emerge, and we we talked about that yesterday. So I think that's something to keep. Uh, to keep in mind as well, because that'll be happening later this week as well, unless there is some some dramatic change. Um, yesterday, toward the end of our program, about the last 20 minutes or so, uh, we began to make inroads into an area of higher education that I had indicated that I did want to continue uh, to pursue today. This is obviously a topic that's very close to me. It's one that I feel very strongly about. Uh, it's one that we've spent a lot of time on uh, here in the virtual center. And, you know, I, I at, at the risk of, of beating a dead horse, so to speak, by, by revisiting this too, too many times, let me basically say from my own perspective that I really believe, and this could be a bias on my part because my entire professional life has been spent for the most part in, in higher education. But the fact of the matter is, I do truly believe that the whole issue of civic responsibility, the behavior of citizens in a republic, is directly contingent on the quality of the education that we make available to our young people. And I, I really believe that. And I really believe that the success and future of the nation depends on this issue. I think this issue, more than any other, is the determinant, determining driving factor in how successful the future will be or can be for this nation. So I don't at all apologize for visiting it, I, revisiting it. I think that in a popular government like this one, where citizens are expected, to play an important informed role in the direction of the nation and its priorities and the way basically society chooses to deal with its own people. I think education has an incredible role, important, incredibly important role to play. And if I tend to be critical at all, and I am in many areas, it's because I believe that higher education specifically, education generally, higher education specifically, has been woefully deficient in its responsibilities to the nation in terms of what it is doing and what it refuses to do in the area of educating our people. And so I continue to push this issue because I believe it is very important. Over the last few days, as, as I mentioned yesterday, over this past weekend, uh, two, what I think are incredibly important pieces of writing surfaced. One of them, an article by Marilyn Robinson in the latest edition, the November edition of the New York Review of Books. Um, it is a book that she is getting ready to publish, and this article in the New York Review basically is a synopsis of what she will say in book form when it comes out in the near future. The title of her, of her article in the New York Review 
is the same title that her book will carry, which is What Are We Doing Here? And it deals specifically, it deals with the issue of higher education, specifically with the, with the issue of the humanities and the values of the humanities. What are they worth? What good do they do? Why do we continue to spend so much time and give so much attention on humanities education? And basically, her overall theme, it seems to me, raises a question that has come up previously over and over again. And yesterday, in the introductory comments I made at the end of our program on this particular issue, I went all the way back to Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Franklin's role it, during the creation of the College of Philadelphia in the 18th century. And Franklin's plea, plea, excuse me, Franklin's plea for more useful education, for education that was more useful to the professions, more specifically to commerce and to business. And basically, Franklin's argument was very, very practical, very direct, and very common sense, very honestly. With the emergence of entrepreneurism in America, with the emerging growth of urban areas like Philadelphia and Boston and Baltimore and New York, it, it seems to me, it seemed to him, that our educational establishment, our colleges, universities, not universities yet, but our colleges, should put much more attention into the practical education of students so that students could pick up what they needed in order to get a successful beginning in the field of business. And the assumption being, if we had more intelligent people with better education and better training, in this area, the overall impact on the standard of living on the country would, in the country would be greater. The results would be much more fruitful because the people involved in starting and operating our businesses would be better educated, more informed, more insightful, better trained, and better able to make the kinds of decisions that would not only drive their own businesses forward, but in the process would drive the nation and its commercial expertise forward as well. And then I believe that I mentioned yesterday, and I'm touching bases here, the so-called Yale report that was a report written on higher education by the Yale faculty in 1828. Of course, 1828, for those... Um, who are really into American history, of course, is the very uh, important election in the early 19th century, the election of Andrew Jackson uh, in the election of 1828. So that's what makes the year 1828 significant to, to most people. In that year, this Yale report was published. And it was in response to exactly the same considerations and concerns that Benjamin Franklin had expressed earlier, namely that our educational establishment had to get with it and our educational establishment had to retool itself in order to fall into line and begin to support the priorities of a growing commercial base in this country as well as a budding industrial base as well. We weren't looking obviously at this point on industrialism per se, that comes later in the 19th century. But what we're looking at is the importation of factories from Europe to the New World. And we're beginning to see textile mills emerging in New England. We're being, beginning to see the, the first stages of what is going to be in America the Industrial Revolution. And what this does more than anything else is put pressure on institutions like Yale to upgrade and modernize their curriculum and get their curriculum more in line with the priorities of the nation at the time. And in response to that, the Yale faculty puts together its report 
in defense of traditional classical education, a, an extensive defense of classical foreign languages and their importance in the education of young people. And the, one of the major themes of the Yale report is, the, is that a, an undergraduate college education for young people in no way should seek to educate students in what they are going to need as a career foundation for their future as business people, as entrepreneurs, as budding capitalists. The purpose of an undergraduate education, the Yale faculty argued, was principally to teach students how to learn so that they can continue to learn through their working lives. To build the foundation, to establish the core, if you will, and I use that word very advisedly, given all the emphasis we've had in recent months and years over the so-called common core. Because the common core is driven, is based upon the same kinds of assumptions that the Yale report is based upon. Namely, that there is a certain set of core subjects. There's certain foundation of knowledge that all educated people must have. And the degree to which this common core this curriculum foundation is established is going to determine future knowledge. It's going to determine the individual's ability to continue to learn throughout where his working, his, well, it was going to say his or her, because that's true today, but at that time it was his working lives. Basically, the idea was that learning is content driven and that the intellectual skills, the so-called cognitive skills that are associated with quality learning become the tools for future learning and applying those skills to the basic core content subjects needs to be the foundation of an undergraduate education. And that's really the basis of the Yale report. So it is a report that is driven primarily by an effort to respond to the calls for a more useful, um, economically driven education for young people. And I think that's the issue. So this debate between the humanities and more career-driven education has been going on for a long time. With the Industrial Revolution, of course, the vast majority of the masses of our people end up going into the industrial segment of society. They end up either working in factories, many of them, or into middle management positions within an industrial environment. And that once again renews the debate over the, the, the issues of practical education versus much more abstract theoretical education as reflected in the so-called humanities and social sciences, if you will. With the emergence at the beginning of the 20th century of the so-called progressive movement and John Dewey's influence on education and the, in, the implication or the pressure to make school, now we're not talking higher education so much, we're talking uh, basic uh, grade school education, grades 1 through 12. Uh, we're talking about the idea, Dewey's idea, of looking at education as what he called preparation for life. And the assumption is that what children are taught in school 
<coughs> needs to more directly pertain to what these people are going to need and be doing for the rest of their lives. The assumption being, of course, that if you can tell, if you know ahead of time where most of your students are going to be headed, then it only makes sense to retool the education system to prepare students for being successful in those particular endeavors. And since most of the masses of young people are going to be working in industry, are going to be working in factories, then our education system begins to model itself on the realities of the industrial world. Schools are organized. The school day is organized around around time blocks, around class time rigidly adhered to. The student's day is dominated by responding to bells at the beginning of a period, at the end of a class period. Students are basically taught, and, and an emphasis is put on things like obedience, dependability, responsibility, promptness, being on time, being dutiful, taking your work seriously, um, doing one's best to meet the responsibilities of heading a family, of being responsible for a family, of raising children, of supporting a family. All of these things become academic priorities in our, in our public school system. And the implication is Higher education, you know, prepares the people who are going to manage this system. They're going to be your management experts. They're going to be your accountants. They're going to be your timekeepers and your bookkeepers and all the rest of it. And the implication is that the entire academic system, educational system at all levels, need to be driven by the priorities of the industrial system. And so, in effect, one could argue that throughout much of the 20th century, education seemed to be falling into line and that finally, two centuries after the fact, Benjamin Franklin's argument was beginning to be listened to. It was, a, it was gaining credibility, it was gaining support. However, the fact of the matter is, the humanities in higher education continue to drive and dominate curriculum for most students in higher education. And that's really the basis of Marilyn Robinson's article, What Are We Doing Here? Because now the question has been raised again about the value of humanities education. Marilyn Robinson's article is a defense of humanities education, a defense of traditional higher education that is driven, that is based on the humanities. Her point, her whole point is, and I think it's hard to challenge this if you think about it, that since the emphasis on humanism began, and she basically establishes it around the year 1500, and she said if you think about it, over the last 500 years or so, Our education system has pretty much been based on a humanities foundation education. And it has enabled us to establish the highest standard of living for the most people of any culture in the history of man. So the question she raises is, why do we continue to question this? Why do we continue to question success? When I read this piece, I was so moved by it that I had to put the link on Facebook, and it is on our Facebook page. And I encourage you to take advantage 
of access to that article. You can find the posting on our Facebook page with the link to Marilyn Robinson's argument, what are we doing here? Or if you'd like, you can go directly to the New York Review of Books website and look at the current edition of the New York Review, dated November 9th. And you'll see what are we doing here as a feature article. It's online. It is available. And of course, I think m most of you who are aware with the New York of, of the New York Review of Books know that it's a subscription operation. It's an expensive publication. While it is available online, probably two out of every three articles are restricted to subscribers. A very select number of the articles in each edition of the New York Review are made available to the general public. This article by Marilyn Robinson is one of those. You don't have to be a subscriber to the New York Review of Books in order to have access to this article. In my posting on Facebook, I address the following issue. This is what I said in my opening paragraph as a way to indicate why I believe that Marilyn Robinson's article is one that is definitely worth a read. The value of the humanities, contemporary threats to an appreciation of books, literature that speaks to the value of every human being, the danger that the current, that the culture of the modern university is once again under attack because of its persistent adherence to curriculum that highlights the humanities. Every one of these statements is addressed by Marilyn Robinson in her article, What Are We Doing Here? I think it's very obvious why I am particularly interested in this. Let me share with you what I think is one of the most poignant paragraphs in the entire article. Marilyn Robinson says the following, quote, there is a great deal of questioning now of the value of the humanities, those aptly named disciplines that make us consider what human beings have been and are and will be. There's growing pressure on our great universities, she explains, to equip our young people to be what the Fabians used to call brain workers. They are to be skilled laborers in the new economy, intellectually nimble, nimble enough to meet its needs, which we know will change constantly and unpredictably, Robinson says. Then she compares the human products of an education with those considerations as priorities, she compares the products of an education under that foundation with the robots, which many of these graduates will be competing with for jobs. Respect for what they know or what they can do, she, she suggests, has no place in this market-driven skills-based agenda. And what Marilyn Robinson is speaking to, of course, is the so-called new capitalism, which we spent so much time on by looking at the writings of Richard Sennett. And you'll remember we spent quite a bit of time with Richard Sennett and his book on the new capitalism and the differences between the priorities of capitalism today and the priorities of capitalism of the past and what education was designed or should be doing in order to prepare our people for that particular capitalist system. Robinson gives us her take on what the ideal education of those people who believe 
that education needs to be much more useful, much more tuned in to the needs of new capitalism, she basically cap encapsulates it this way, quote, to be as strong as we need to be, we must have a highly efficient economy. Society must be disciplined, stripped down to achieve this efficiency and to make us all better foot soldiers. The alternative is decadence, the eclipse of our civilization by one with more fire in its belly, unquote. And then she builds her defense of humanities education on a paragraph that she takes from the introduction of de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, which many of us have read. That's one, this is one of these books that many of us claim to have read because it's so popular and so frequently cited. Most of us will, will acknowledge that we've read it, even though in fact many of us have not. But the paragraph in question from de Tocqueville's introduction becomes the key to her whole case in defense of the humanities. Here's that paragraph from de Tocqueville. From the moment when the exercise of intelligence had become a source of strength and wealth, each step in the development of science, each new area of knowledge, each fresh idea had to be viewed as a seed of power placed within people's grasp. Poetry, eloquence, memory, the beauty of wit, the fires of imagination, the depth of thought, all these gifts which heaven shares, shares out by chance turn to the advantage of democracy. And even when they belong to the enemies of democracy, they still promoted its cause by highlighting the natural grandeur of man. Its victories spread alongside those of civilization and education. Literature was an arsenal open to all, where the weak and the poor could always find arms." Unquote. Basically, what the Tocqueville is talking about here is the benefits of humanities-driven education and the direct contribution that such education plays to democracy. What humanities-driven education does, the Tocqueville is saying, and Robinson obviously believes, what humanities education does is make the key ingredients of democracy available to the masses through literature. Specifically, poetry, eloquence, memory, the beauty of wit, the fires of imagination, the depth of thought, all of these things which traditionally education has made available only to the elite. The humanities makes available to everybody. Therefore, de Tocqueville believes, humanities education is directly responsible for the success of democracy in America. It's access to literature access to the humanities, access for the many to the ingredients of a humanities education that sustains democracy. If you remove it, if you de-emphasize it, if you shift the priorities of education towards something else, like the needs of the marketplace, you are in effect tampering with the very success of the democratic foundation of this society, of this culture, of this political experiment.
which we call America. That's powerful. All of these things, all of these benefits of humanity's education, poetry, eloquence, memory, beauty of wit, fires of imagination, depth of thought, all of these things speak to what the Tocqueville called the natural grandeur of man. These are the key ingredients of what sustains democracy as a viable force in the world. If you remove it, you are literally jeopardizing the success of democracy. The Tocqueville believed that. Marilyn Robinson believes that. I believe that. To replace these with what is touted as the best way to get a job and to earn a living is to undercut the very basis of democracy itself, I said in my comments on Facebook. Those most responsible for trying to do that, the question is, are they really aware of what they're doing? They may not be. But on the other hand, they damn well might be. And if that's true, that's even worse. Because we, we wouldn't be blundering into a mistake. We would be being led into it. The fact of the matter is, many of us, Marilyn Robinson believes, and so do I, are really not aware of how vulnerable and how much at risk we might really be as human beings, as a civilization. Robinson shares with us a story. This, it's one line in, this, in the article, but it really jumped out at me. She tells the story about her conversation with a cab driver who told her that the world was something he never knew might even interest him. And then he read a book. Think about that. I never knew that the world was anything I could even care about. And then I read a book. Let me be a little bit more pointed than that. Go to the New York Times and look at the article, The Not Lost Children of Chum. Read that book and tell me that that doesn't connect you with a whole series, a whole set, a whole range of emotions that you didn't even know you had. You will be pained. You will be moved. You will look at the photographs in the article of some of these children, these angelic faces, you cannot respond any other way than to be moved. It could be to tears. It could be to anger. It could be both. When I read this article, I walked away conflicted with a series of emotions that were all mixed up, all confused at the same time. I was sad, I was happy. I was happy because I had just read an article that touched me very deeply. I had read a piece of literature that I was grateful for having had the privilege of reading. But at the same time, the subject of that writing was painful. 
the church that I grew up in was the villain here. It was to a large, to the almost complete degree, responsible for what had happened to these children. To perpetuating a culture which was committed to the idea that if a child was brought into the world, not of its own accord, not of its own will, it didn't choose to be born. But if those responsible for that birth were not married, then the child's existence couldn't even be recognized. It was a life that didn't exist. It was a human being without a name. It died without memory, without a legacy, without a chance to live. And all of this was condoned by a church that is defined by the message of the Gospels. Tell me that that doesn't conflict you. It did me. Toward the end of Marilyn Robinson's essay, I focused on Facebook on a sentence that seemed to me to basically be the bottom line of this whole argument about humanity's education and the value of it. And this is what Marilyn Robinson says. The object is clear. To create a virtual army out of the general population who will compete successfully against whomever for whatever into an endless future at profound cost to themselves. Unquote. That's what those who argue for more practical, more useful education are asking us to do. They are asking us to surrender access to those intellectual and emotional experiences that make us human. For many years, I've been focusing on this in a lot of my teaching. What is the ultimate, the final purpose of education? I believe that the purpose of education is to teach us to be human. We are born as human beings. But until we are educated, we really aren't human. When we are educated into being human, it's only then that we can appreciate what being human means. At that point, those who are not human, who have not been so educated, stand out. They become very clear to us because they are so different than we are. Robinson goes on. The ideal worker in today's new capitalism will not have a head full of useless poetry, but instead will be potentially omnicompetent in service to the ever-changing needs and demands of the new economy. Highly trained, that is, to acquire some undescribed skill set that will be proof against obsolescence. We await particulars, unquote. Let me conclude Marilyn Robinson's article by saying that the last three words that I put on the Facebook posting are the following, a must read. 
I do believe that. I also believe that if you go to the New York Times and you read about the lost children of Chum, and you read Marilyn Robinson's article about humanities driven education, you will know exactly what she's talking about because you will have experienced it. I believe that this is an incredibly important and powerful message. There was another article that was published this past weekend. It wasn't exactly on the same subject, but ironically it was. It's an article by Frank Bruni that appeared in the New York Times. It's dated Saturday but it appeared in Sunday morning's New York Times book review section. The title of it, Too Many Colleges Flunk Trump 101. Obviously, this particular article by Frank Bruni touches on politics, which most of the articles, I would suggest, in our major publications seem to do of late. Frank Bruni goes to a a publication. I don't know how many folks are familiar with this, but it's a publication in higher education, the title of which is Inside Higher Education. It includes articles directly pertinent to higher education, to the things that are happening in our colleges and universities and in our classrooms. And what Bruni reminds us or tells us is that every year inside higher education adds new questions to an annual survey that it administers to college admissions officials. This particular initiative each year is designed to get the latest update on what student recruits what college admissions people are looking for in students. Bruni's interest in this particular subject is driven by the election of Donald Trump last November because the new questions on the inside higher ed survey, Bruni says, were inspired by Donald Trump. On Facebook, I made a a specific point. (coughs) Excuse me. Excuse me. On Facebook, I made a specific point of addressing Bruni's statement that these questions were inspired by Donald Trump. I wanted to make the point that he doesn't mean specifically or directly inspired by Donald Trump. What he means is these questions are are informed by or inspired by the election of Donald Trump. By the fact that so many people voted for him and the results of the election were not anticipated or expected by anybody, theoretically. Let me put that, let me rephrase that. By anybody who mattered, in quotes. There are a number of people who believed that there were enough disgruntled people in this country that Trump could win. But the pundits, the pollsters, the experts never believed it. Right up until the very end, they believed Hillary Clinton was going to win this election. Fact of the matter is, right up to the very end, Hillary Clinton believed that she was going to win this election. Basically, the new questions on the inside higher ed survey spoke to the following. Whether their schools had intensified efforts to recruit students from more rural areas. 38% said yes, they had. 30% said that their schools were looking harder for 
and at students from poor white families. This speaks to the idea that President Trump's base, those that got him elected in states that he was never expected to carry, were uneducated, working class whites, poor whites. That's what the that's what the surveys have told us about the election. And now these admissions people are acknowledging that their colleges have changed their focus and that significant numbers of them are focusing on encouraging or recruiting these particular people who elected Donald Trump. 8% of those who responded to the survey said that they were looking for what they believed to be politically conservative students, unquote. In my Facebook posting, I raised a question about Bruni's article at, on this point. When he, in, when he introduces the idea of conservative into this conversation, he really shifts the focus of the article. And I don't think it's a legitimate thing to do. But we'll see. These people were obviously the estranged, the disaffected, the angry, the frustrated. They elected Donald Trump. Scott Jasek, who is editor of Inside Higher Education, was interviewed by Frank Bruni for this article. And Jasek said the following about the election and about the nature of these voters. Quote, after the election, he said, I sensed from talking to leaders of colleges a lot of soul searching about the fact that college presidents and students assumed that one thing was going to happen on election day and it did not. Some people woke up the day after the election and realized that every surrounding county voted in a different way than the college did. Unquote. Let me emphasize that particular sentence. Some people woke up on the day after the election and realized that every surrounding county voted in a different way than the college did. Unquote. That sentence seems to speak to the disconnect between institutions of higher education and the communities in which they're located. I would suggest to you that that's a problem. That's a higher education problem. I can relate specifically to that because where I'm broadcasting from, I have spent the better part of my professional life teaching in an institution of higher education in a rural area, southern West Virginia. The college I taught at, Concord University, was founded in the year 1872. A number of other state colleges in West Virginia were founded during that same period. The state of West Virginia, after it was created in 1863, was following through on the mission of the idea of land-grant colleges. The idea that institutions of higher education had a responsibility to uplift the communities in which they lived by educating the people around them. This sentence 
by the editor of Inside Higher Ed that on the day after the election, college officials began to realize that all the counties around them voted differently than they did, suggests to me that the impact colleges were intended to have on their communities has never happened. It didn't happen. Instead of being institutions which directly influenced the communities which funded them, these institutions became self-serving entities whose principal goals were to sustain themselves and keep themselves isolated and removed from the peoples and the communities around them. The people on the campus developed a mentality of elitism and superiority, which convinced them that they were better, more important, and more intelligent than the communities around them. And the only way they could sustain themselves was to isolate themselves from that very community. And so the irony of ironies in education, higher education in this country is that our higher education institutions have made it their mission not to serve, but to self-serve. But at the same time, to continually deliver the message to taxpayers that they were performing a public service by educating the best and the brightest from amongst the surrounding population. But I would suggest to you that educating the best and the brightest is an exercise in futility for the communities. What colleges were doing was identifying and recruiting the best and the brightest from the local community, isolating these intelligent students from, the, from their own communities and educating them to leave, not to serve. A few years ago, I submitted an application for the president the presidency of the institution that I retired from. I honestly never expected to get the job. To be honest with you, I really never expected to get an interview. But I did believe that better than 25 years of service to that institution might possibly get me an interview, and it's the interview that I wanted. I didn't expect the job. But I wanted the interview because I wanted the opportunity to speak to the powers that be at this university and tell them that they were committing a sin. That in reality, all you had to do was travel one mile from the campus. And you would never know that there was a college or university within 100 miles of where you were. This college had been in existence since 1872. And in all that time, it has had almost no impact on the surrounding community. 
it was located. In fact, a number of people who are, you know, have very prominent positions at the institution have acknowledged this, have said this. If you were locating a college in this region now, where we are is the last place you would put it. Because where we are located is in the most rural part of the whole region. We need to be, they said, we should be where the people are. Not off here in the mountains, isolated from the mainstream of the local community. But the irony is that's the point. This institution has been successful for its entire existence in keeping the community at arm's length and establishing a culture which is totally different from that in the communities around it. Of course the people in the communities and counties around the institutions would vote differently than the people on the campus voted. They live in totally different worlds. My problem with Frank Bruni's article is that Frank Bruni from this point on, makes this article more about politics than about higher education. In one sense. In another sense, he doesn't, and I'll get to that, because we do have a little bit of time left in today's program to address this. And I think it's, it's a very, very important issue. There's quite a bit of argument today about the liberal bias of our college cam on our college campuses. The fact that our institutions of higher education have become hotbeds of liberalism and that to a large degree these liberal institutions, these liberal campuses have gone to great lengths to keep conservative points of view from infiltrating the campuses. We're seeing it today in the numbers of examples of college communities, university communities, that have, con have held demonstrations against certain conservative speakers who have been scheduled to come to that campus and then their speeches or their presentations have been canceled because of demonstrations and the dangers of people getting hurt. Conservatives have been making a conscious effort to try to more accurately balance our college campuses by finding ways to bring more conservative points of view to the campus. The concern being that students who are being educated on our campuses are being educated by liberals. They graduate as liberals and their education consequently has been very ideologically biased and one-sided, heavily weighted to the left side of the political spectrum. Bruni addresses this issue. In 2013, he says, the University of Colorado at Boulder welcomed its first scholar in conservative thought. A specific teaching position created to bring someone from the right to the campus each year. In 2015, Jonathan Haidt, social psychologist at NYU at New York University, founded something called the Heterodox Academy, 
an organization that promotes intellectual diversity in higher education. A growing number of educators have been speaking about the possibility of an affirmative action program for conservative professors because of the hugely disproportionate percentage of liberal faculty, especially in the humanities and social sciences. Bruni's position or argument is that Donald Trump's election both imperiled and emboldened this movement. To some college administrators, Bruni said, it was proof that the barbarians were at the gate and that students needed safe spaces more than ever. Understanding what happened on November 8th, many campuses believed, was less important than fighting to make sure it didn't happen anymore. And this is a quote from Bruni. The idea that the only people who voted for Trump have missing front teeth is so extraordinary. And yet I think that's largely what people in the academy think, said Gene Yarbrough, a conservative professor of political science at Bowdoin College in Maine, who acknowledges that she herself voted for Donald Trump. These faculty members, she added, consider the election of 2016 an illegitimate election. They're not worried about being out of touch with America, she says. Others, however, are genuinely concerned. Higher, Inside Higher Education recently published an article in which college placement advisors said that some clients wanted to stay clear of certain elite schools like Yale and Brown that struck them as being overzealously progressive. Michael Roth, president of Wesleyan University in Connecticut, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal recently in which he said, quote, to create deeper intellectual and political diversity, we need an affirmative action program for the full range of conservative ideas and traditions, because on too many of our campuses, they seldom get the kind of sustained scholarly attention that they deserve. Basically then, what Bruni is pointing out in this entire article is that there is a recognition that our colleges have become too liberal, that they've become too unbalanced ideologically, and that the fact of the matter is they've lost touch with the communities around them. The people around them elected Donald Trump, while the people on campus would never in God's world dream of casting a ballot for somebody like that. And what Bruni's message is that colleges and universities are now beginning to recognize their own biases. And they're now beginning to realize that they've got to become more ideologically balanced. They've got to have more conservative faculty members. And especially, they've got to start recruiting more conservative students. Because if the communities continue to go in one direction and the colleges insist in not going in that direction, then these institutions will come, become even more removed from the service areas that they're being funded to serve. It'll become a total disconnect. Let me suggest to you a major problem with this. It's not a liberal perspective, neither is it a conservative perspective. I would suggest to you it's an education perspective. Bruni's assumption 
But let's be honest, the assumptions of most people in higher education is that the purpose of a college education is to educate students in the truth. And since these institutions, for the most part, are liberal, the faculty who teach at these institutions are liberal, then the basic assumption is a college education, by definition, is an education designed to produce liberals. It is really not education at all. It's mind control. It's brainwashing. It's sales. It's spin. It's ideological mind control. If these institutions believe that their principal goal is to educate students, but more specifically, that educating students means turning out liberals, then they aren't educating, they are indoctrinating. But let me go even further than that. What's the solution that conservatives have? The conservative answer to that is to hire conservative professors who will indoctrinate students the other way. The way you address the problem of indoctrination is counter-indoctrination. The ideal being, if you get a real ideological balance on campus between liberals and conservatives, students will be buffeted back and forth between the liberal perspective and the conservative perspective. And theoret theoretically, they will be graduated with enough education to choose between the two. I would suggest to you that that's the most frightening aspect of this entire argument. Because it suggests that there's really not a clear perspective on what education really means in any of this. A solid quality education, I would argue, would equip students to recognize bias, where, whether it was liberal bias or conservative bias. They would be educated enough to recognize spin. Hey, Bill. They, yes, Bob. I, I'm, I, just to steal the last few minutes from you, I, I, just, I, I have to tell you that, that uh, you've been on fire today. And this is this is this is a this is one this is one of yours for the ages that this day is, uh, this program is. And Are you kidding? No, no, no. I'm not kidding. Oh my God! I don't believe. Okay. So. I believe. I, I appreciate that. Fifteen years. Fifteen years is a little late for me to start blowing smoke at you. Okay, buddy. Uh, but that having been said, you said something a minute ago that just went, you know, bing, and the little choir of angels fired up and everything. You said, you know, we've got this idea that. The, the purpose of higher education is to teach students the truth. And I'm one of the, you know, because, you know, I don't do faith. I don't believe in things, okay. general, generally speaking. And so a lot of time when people use the word truth, my mind inserts the word facts. Right. Because, because you know, if, in, in mathematics and the sciences, we deal in facts. We like I'm a mathematician, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, but, yeah. But 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 there are parts, and and you know those are parts of the liberal arts too, mathematics and biology and chemistry, right, exactly. And, 
Uh, you know, there, there's no faith based chemistry. OK, there's no right. conservative chemistry. There's no conservative physics. And so I, I, you know, what you were saying there a minute ago just kind of made me bark at the moon. Because what it is, and, and I'll speak plainly, you know, these clowns uh, go absolutely, these right wing clown uh, 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 academics go absolutely hog wild if a black kid gets into college. Uh, in, in front of a white, uh, in front of a white kid, similarly, uh, 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 similarly skilled or similarly intelligent. On the other hand, they want their wingnut welfare. They want, they damn well demand their wingnut uh, affirmative action. You're exactly right. And uh, but the fact of the matter is, by the time you get to college, um, like I said, there's no there's no conservative or liberal algebra. There's no conservative or liberal no. uh, geology. You know what you You're do right. with it can be conservative or liberal, right? But You're right. But 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 it's not where the trouble comes in is that stuff that makes us quintessentially human, right? And that is that's your anthropology, your sociology, your right. your, your 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 literature, your poetry, your music, so, your dance, your theater, your back, painting. You're back to Marilyn Robinson's article here. Yes. It's what makes people human. And, 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 and so, so in reality, then, when we talk about the purpose of education, these people believe is to teach the truth. The purpose of education is to teach students the skills they need to find the truth. Bingo. It is to that's, teach people that's the to answer. seek the truth. I, a long time ago, when I was getting ready to go off to college, you know, I just saddled up my dinosaur and everything. Um, I, I had a very, very good high school teacher who looked at me and said, I want you to understand something before you leave. You're not going, she, she said, we've spent the last 12 years of your life giving you the basics so mm -hmm. that someday you could learn. Right. And now you're going to go to college and you're going to learn how to learn. Right. And then if you do things after your bachelor de bachelor's degree, if you achieve mastery in something, that's when the learning starts. That's exactly right, Bob. That's the Yale report. And, 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 and this has caused me over the years, Bill, to think about, I mean, because, you know, I, I went to Harvard on the Mon. I'm a humble son of a, of a, of a, of a state university. Uh, that, that, that as often as not is known for its beer consumption as it is for its Rhodes Scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, I th and I had great professors, and I think about them a lot because of how they changed my life. But if I sit down and start trying to do a quantitative analysis of where I learned things, Bill, precious damn little of it happened in college. That's right. That's right. It's the it's the it's the skill set and the toolkit and and the, the the impetus and the urge and the yearning that college and, and, and the rest of education instilled in me to go and keep learning stuff. That's right. And, That's right. And, and, and I'd guess that, you know, uh, counting it all together, including law school, um, most of what I learned happened after I left. Yep. So, you know, but you're right, Bob, because, the, I mean, these people who believe that they're teaching the truth, they're not, to, theoretically, they're not supposed to be teaching the truth. They, first of all, they're not supposed to be teaching things and presenting it as truth. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be teaching students how to pursue truth and also get students to want to pursue truth. To want to answer those questions. I, I, I ran up and down, you know, because my parents were still in Alabama. I was going to school in West Virginia, so I would have these these long 700 mile drives to and from uh, home and school. And when you're by yourself in a vehicle for that long, all you do is think. Right. And and it's pretty, and, and it's pretty that, valuable time. Well, it's extremely valuable time, and you and and, and you start trying to forge, uh, you know, forge connections. You know, right. and, and, and I think back, I think back to the famous last words of Socrates, you know, they were all gathered around him there. He'd been, he'd been convicted for corrupting the youth. And he looked at them and he said, Socrates, what is truth? Socrates, what is beauty? Never, never do one of you say Socrates, hemlock is poison. Mm -hmm. That's a joke. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. But but the fact of the matter is, what is truth and what is beauty is very different from Socrates' hemlock is poison. Yeah. 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 Bob, I, I, I think we probably need to, to, well, to I, I, I stole, if you don't mind, I, no, 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 I stole, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to this tomorrow if we get a chance. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd, li- I'd, I'd love I, to because I, I really think this is important. I think this is a nail you can countersink if you just, if you set your mind to it. Yeah, I think this is something we really need to, dr- to, to drive home because this is important. Thank you, Bob. Oh, I thank appreciate you, Bill. You so thank much. you so much for a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for your continued support of the Virtual Center. I hope that we will see you tomorrow. We'll be on at our regular time, which is 1 p.m. in the East. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Be kind to each other. We look forward to being with you again on tomorrow's program here at the Virtual Center. Thank you.